great friend of the law going back many, many years. He served on uh, uh, selection committees for multiple programs here and has been participant previous years. And we're so uh, grateful and glad that he's here with us tonight. Beth Flicker. trying to avoid uh, doing plot reveals. So I'm going to now try to avoid <laughs> doing plot reveals. Um, but you have one of maybe my favorite stage directions of, <laughs> of all of the plays that I read, which is uh, at the end of Act One, there's a stage direction that says, Alma breathes deeply. She is so many people right now. Mm. Mm. And then at the end of the play, her now college-age daughter says in a speech, I'm going to swing on swing until I feel like just one person. So I'm really intrigued by this idea of fractured identity in the play, how it can get you through hard times in life. Happily, you're nodding, so I'm guessing this is something you're exploring, and I'm wondering, do you feel like this is true to the world in general, to women, or to simply these characters? Um, I think it's very true to the world in general, I think one of the scariest things about this play is it's just, two, it's two people being alone together and it's the kind of conversation no one was expecting to have that you just sort of find yourself in and it becomes a conversation that's gonna change your life and change things you believed in and my hope with the play is both of these moments of connection and challenge are cracking these people open and that they are, are made different. Um, and I think this fracturedness is there, it would be nice to escape into this sort of like politeness or to say like, oh, so good to meet you. I'll see you around, which Alma tries to do many times. She's like, I have to go right now. Um, but that there's something that's pulling them back. So uh, there's these questions too of fault and blame and moments where it's like, oh, now these two people hate each other. And that could be the end, but what if it's not? What if, what if there's another push um, and we hold that moment a little bit more and they, they keep working on each other? Um, and my hope is that it 
it feels scary um, to sort of have another person get into those personal parts of yourself where maybe you're not the proudest of some of your ideas or some of the connections or you have to give up something that you've been holding on to. Yeah, beautiful. Will you share a little bit of the play with us? I will. Um, so this is from the first act. Uh, Leslie, who is new in town, is telling Alma about their, um, her last Halloween costume. It's the first act takes place just after Halloween. Uh, Bruce is Leslie's son. It is also the name of her husband. Um, Leslie. Me and Bruce like to read the story of Ferdinand. I like to read him stories about peaceful animals, and Ferdinand is such a sweetheart. I'd like Bruce to grow up to be something like that, like a dancer or something. Plus, I like cows. I wanted to be a cow for Halloween, a nice family-appropriate cow, but Bruce vetoed it. He said I was too old, and he hates cows. <coughs> Alma, what a jerk. I was like, well, I don't know. He might be right. Last year was a disaster. I had a whole vision, but Alma, what were you? Let's say. A zombie pirate queen? <laughs> Not family appropriate. I invested in my arms back then. Lives are pretty good too. We had a babysitter and a party, a dream come true. I was just gonna be a pirate queen, but then the whole party was zombie themed, so I had to adapt. Because themes are important, especially with movie people. <laughs> but apparently I was over enthusiastic and inappropriate. <laughs> Alma, what did you do? Leslie, what do you think of when you think pirate? Alma, an eye patch? Leslie, what animal? Alma, a parrot on your shoulder. Leslie, exactly. Bruce said the parrot pushed it over the edge from fun to fucked up. Do you want to see a picture? Alma, okay. Leslie gets her phone. Leslie, you aren't going to be offended or think less of me? I mean, in some ways, in many ways, it's the best costume. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie hands Alma her phone. Alma looks. It's pretty crazy. Alma, is that bird? Leslie, from natural causes. <laughs> <laughs> Alma, where did you even find a dead parrot? <laughs> Leslie, the internet. <laughs> Alma, that is commitment. <laughs> Leslie, right? But people said it was offensive. I didn't know the owners had birds. Who has birds? <laughs> swipe, there's more. Alma swipes, looks at more pictures. Bruce didn't even dress up, loser. Alma, is that him? Leslie, no, that's his friend Jim. He was a lawyer for the undead, specializing in living wills. I mean that. <laughs> oh, here's Bruce, big Bruce, in his regular boring clothes, not even an eye patch. Alma looks. Her temperature drops. She looks hard. Leslie looks at her. You okay? Alma. Yeah. Alma hands Leslie the phone back. That was a crazy costume. Leslie, next year I'm gonna make something fantastic and family friendly, you'll see. Alma, right, next year. You think they'll stay? Leslie, Bruce wants to be here. Alma, right, tax incentives. Leslie, yeah, and Bruce has this idea it's a good place for families. They heard the quality of life was really good and it was safe, so here we are. We'll settle in soon. It's not bad here, it's really nice. Do you like it? You must. Alma, I do. You know, I actually, we have to go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Claire. Um, <laughs> we've been talking about Claire's plot for the last couple hours. So this is Claire Pichel, and she's going to tell us a little bit about Pilgrims. Oh my god, you're making me sound so self-centered. No, it's because it's so about. fun. Um, it's, <laughs> uh, Pilgrims takes place on a spaceship, and it's about a soldier. Um, they're going to this other planet that the soldier has already been to. There's already been a war over there. And he's he, this soldier and this young adolescent girl are stuck together in this cabin on the spaceship, are quarantined together with only themselves for company, and um, they're both sort of have experienced trauma and um, process trauma in different ways. And so it becomes sort of a play about like how do two people who are essentially strangers um, connect uh, on a spaceship? And then there's 
a robot, too, for fun. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's great. Good. Um, so I was reading your Playwrights Corner interview, which you can read their interviews on, on the LARC website, and you talk about people performing roles they're programmed to play, or the roles they aspire to play, or the roles they get stuck in, and the role that society has in all of that. Yeah. And I found it particularly interesting because I was listening to the NPR Politics podcast this morning, which was talking about the roles that we are, tend to be in in terms of our political opinions and that we get so trapped in them that we otherize the other side and cease to sort of see them as human or cease to feel any empathy for them or to understand why they deserve empathy. So I'm wondering, is, is there a role you see for your play, for art in general, um, that helps people understand the nature of those roles, the personal agency we can take to break out of them, um, and to understand the people that we do tend to otherize. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. I think, uh, I mean, I think empathy is the role of art. Um, I see myself like, as an artist, one thing that I can do is sort of uh, illuminate other people's inner worlds, and sometimes. Um, when we are, we have uh, stereotypes and cliches and archetypes that are all available to us at all times, um, and that sometimes we meet someone or we see a story and we think of those archetypes instead of thinking about maybe the specific nature of that person. And um, it's like sort of an extraordinary thing just to realize that everyone is just a com as complex as you are, like your complexities in your inner life. I mean, I know that sounds silly, but. Uh, that your inner life and the things that you are fucked up about or the things that you um, hide are probably similar uh, to other people's inner lives. Um, in terms of like the political nature, uh, definitely, I mean, I think I've been thinking a lot about the people who support Donald Trump and um, the sort of lack of empathy that sometimes the media ha portrays um, when there might, there's been a lot of amazing segments of like why these people have clung on to um, the idea of, of Donald Trump, and it's, you know, like, there was an amazing, I forget where it was, but it was about the coal workers who are basically, like, Donald Trump gives us hope, and, like, that's what, and they have, they're living in these cultures and situations that have no hope. Yeah. And, uh, and maybe it's easy for, certainly me, sometimes to dismiss um, their inner worlds, I think, if I think of them in terms of, like, large um, voting bases instead of made up of individuals. Mm -hmm. um, for this play, I think, uh, yeah, I was thinking a lot about the soldier, um, the role of veteran in uh, our society, and how often what, um, what we ask of veterans, <coughs> and we uh, often, when you talk to veterans, um, we say, thank you for your service. And there's a sense of like, we don't actually want to know what they've experienced. Um, we don't actually want to know the, the way of saying thank you for your service is actually also a way of silencing them. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and there's not really the, um, we don't have the space in our culture to sometimes talk about what actual experiences the, these soldiers have gone through, uh, which is I think why there's such a um, large percentage of uh, suicide and PTSD. Also is just because we don't actually know how to uh, talk about that kind of trauma um, in the same way that I think <laughs> The role, I was thinking a lot about the, how um, the role of a, a girl, like a woman, and what, what it is to, like that kind of role, and what we ascribe to saying like, you're a 14 year old girl, you're a 16 year old girl, I'm ascribing these kind of things that you should be thinking about, and I'm gonna like assume that you think of um, without necessarily knowing or wanting to know more. Yeah, great. Good. I'm not going to do any better than that, so let's do something. <laughs> <laughs> Oof, okay. Um, this is a little section. Um, so the girl, the adolescent girl, has sort of finally got the soldier to do what she wants. And so one of the things that she um, has made a deal with him, that he's going to put on um, a uni his uniform that he's kept. And this is the first time he's, he has his uniform in the closet, but he hasn't worn it um, until this moment. <clears throat> so she's, he's in the bathroom getting changed. Come on, I'm waiting. Hurry up. Hang on. Oh my god, you were such a girl. How is it taking so long? Coming. The soldier exits the bathroom. 
He's dressed in his uniform and he looks a hundred times more comfortable than before. A whole new person. Well, wow, don't make fun of me. No, you look good, real good, like movie star good. Shut up. No, I'm serious, this is totally who I pictured. Like exactly like this, before I came on the ship, I pictured you. It's not quite ironed. No, I mean really, it fits you really well. Thanks. Does it feel different having it on like that? No. Looks different. Yeah, I mean, it's a little, feels comfortable, you know, like the old days. Yeah, cool, really cool. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, I wish I had something to put on like that, like armor. It's not armor. Yeah, but it's like, somehow you look safer. I feel safe looking at you. Good. Okay, uh, whiskey first or game first? Whiskey. He pours them both a shot, they drink. Okay, now we are ready for the big shebang. Shebang, don't make fun of me. Are you ready? I don't know what it is we're doing. We're playing a game. It's not hard, this is my specialty. Are you ready? Yeah, okay. Cowboy or Indian? I don't get it. <laughs> you just choose one, don't think. Cowboy or Indian? Uh, Indian, interesting. Indian or soap opera star? Indian? Indian or astronaut? Astronaut. Uh, astronaut or spy? Spy? Can I change? Wait. Uh, <laughs> no. Spy or husband? Spy. Spy or president? Spy. Really? Spy or Jesus? Uh, come on. That's <laughs> uh, you come on. Uh, spy. Spy. Spy or detective? Detective. Uh, detective or soldier? Detective. Okay. Okay, that's the whole game? <laughs> no, that's how just we decide what we want to play. That's the first stage. You're a detective. Be like that old-fashioned kind. You know, from the old movies, like Humphrey Bogart, be like him. Are you a detective, too? Obviously not. That'd be no fun. I'll be the bombshell. The pretty one you can't help liking. She's swell, but you can't tell if she may also be <laughs> Are you the culprit? That's the wrong question. Also, you're not doing it right. The question is, what is the crime? What is the... No, no, do it in the voice. Come on. <clears throat> uh, miss? Lady? <laughs> I heard there was a crime around these parts, and I'm aiming to get my hands on the criminal. I don't know about uh, But wait, I need a... He fetches his scarf, puts it on his head. Are you talking to me, detective? <laughs> I surely am. Uh, I'm going at his speed so bad. No, no, it's good. Keep going. Why don't you tell me what you witnessed uh, last night? Why don't you tell me how this uh, uh, corpse ended up on this here floor? The corpse? Well, I don't know, <laughs> detective. You see, I was asleep last night, fast asleep, and I never wake up once I close my eyes. I'm one of those heavy dreamers. Now there, you're a smart looking dame. Don't try that again. You didn't hear a gunshot last night, not right outside your door in your own living room. I live in a dangerous neighborhood, detective. I'm afraid I've fallen on hard times. I hear gunshots all the time, and so you see, I've tuned my ear not to hear them. Why, once there was a shootout not two doors down, and you know, I didn't know something was amiss until the morning. Had to step over three bodies to get to my car. Amiss, eh? Yes, I've never been married. <laughs> I never met a man who could handle me. <laughs> Most men aren't like you, I'm afraid. I've been looking for a man like yourself, a war veteran. Someone who has seen hand-to-hand -hand combat. Someone who knows how to practice mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
trying to figure out like what does this kind of work where we see the growth side to be shaping and then ultimately the impact on us as people more broadly. Right. So uh, there are so many connections amongst all of these plays and, and you could compare all of them, right? So you could really get it for yourself. But your play also plays with the role of zip lining. You talked about raising audiences' consciousness in the way that our lives and daily choices affect the lives and choices of other people that we kind of remain blissfully unaware of. Um, so I'm curious uh, for audiences this week and in the future when they see the play, what do you want them talking about in the subway and in the parking lot going home? And the next day when they wake up and go back out into the world, how do you hope they might be changed as they read an article in the newspaper or see somebody on screen that just makes you go back? Yeah, that's a good question. I, that's, it's a tricky one because I don't really know what I want a person to leave with, but I think if I was gonna say something, it would just be to think about all those people as actually people. Like I think that we see these news stories and it's really easy to feel the distance. Like it's extremely easy because they're shot in a certain way and there's like sometimes dramatic music playing. But I think at the end of the day, what I'm trying to do with this play is show that like we're actually all the same in really fundamental ways. And so something I try to do is, like the first two scenes of the play both start with a seduction. And it's to show that like, whether it's in Pakistan or in Las Vegas, like the same things are happening. Like we have the same patterns, we're the same. And I think that's something that I, feel like theater is the perfect instrument to deliver is that like you're seeing people in front of you and you're like oh they're just like me and that's a big thing that I'm trying to do with this play. Right and yet simultaneously I would say these characters are leading very different lives just in terms of the simple risk that they face and getting through the day and, and one group of characters kind of knows they're going to get home at the end of the day and be fine and another set of characters really doesn't. So at the end of the day, is it a fine line between saying we're all the same and in point of fact, people are having very different journeys in life? No, I think that's great. I think that that's ultimately kind of where the guilt comes in, right? It's like on one hand, you wanna equate, you wanna say, look, both sides of this conflict are equally affected, but is that really true? It definitely skews in one direction. Like I would say the biggest <coughs> impact is obviously on the people whose lives are at risk, but sometimes we forget, and I think especially in New York, we kind of have this attitude like, oh, the military, you know, like we kind of like throw it away, like, oh, the military, like there are all this group of people that's all the same, right? And I think that something I wanted to do in this play is really like, <coughs> look at who are these people and what do they believe and why are they going to work every day? Because I think we oversimplify it all the time. And just understanding the quiet suffering that can be happening behind the facade of someone that's all business. So I think, yeah, it's not necessarily equal suffering, but it's definitely both sides are valid to be looking at, I think. Yeah, and that watching somebody just kind of go through the daily steps of life, yeah, it's hard not to then see them as human, yes? Right, exactly, anyone. We, that could be true of anyone, and this play happens to be, you know, people 2,000 miles away. Yeah, so is that the change, maybe walking down the street and seeing the person with the cardboard sign begging, and all of a sudden you're thinking about what their daily life might be? Sure. As opposed to just seeing the image right in front of you? Yeah, I just think that consciousness has the power to change things versus us just being in our bubbles and going, oh, it's my own quiet life. I have to do X, Y, and Z today, and that's it, and then I can go to bed. Like, yeah. no, like every action, like buying a coffee at Starbucks has a ripple effect. And it's like, it's exhausting to think like that <laughs> constantly. But like, I think in the context of theater, especially, like we have some luxury to take some time to think about things, so. Yeah. Great, will you share some with us? Sure, so I'm gonna share the very beginning of the play. Um, so it's South Waziristan in Pakistan, it's evening. Reem and Syed's home. Reem enters quietly, nodding with a finger to her lips. Syed pulls his wife over, kisses her hungrily, puts his hands all over her, whispers in her ear. We can't make any noise. Syed, do you think you'll manage? Listen, you're not very good at keeping quiet. <laughs> she pulls away. She asked me to kill the mosquitoes. What? Wahida, she asked me to kill the mosquitoes, said she didn't like the buzzing. And what did you say? I said the mosquitoes were too high up for me to kill. A beautiful answer from a beautiful head. He makes another attempt, Reem pulls away again. She's never mentioned it before. It's good that she did, no, otherwise we'd have to check her ears. 
What are we supposed to tell her? That the mosquitoes are singing her a lullaby? I don't know. I don't want to lie to her. She's a child. We lie to children. No. <laughs> She's going to be fine. She's strong like her father and very good looking. <laughs> he makes a third attempt. She pulls away. One day she's going to find out, for God's sake, Reem, how many times can we have the same conversation? This isn't the same conversation. She's never mentioned it before. We need to discuss it. Fine, yes, let's discuss it. That's exactly what I wanted to do tonight. <laughs> now, I've made my peace with it, Syed. I really have, but no child should have to grow up like this. What, in a loving family with all the attention in the world, with a beautiful mother who tells her stories, always watching her steps, hesitating while putting one foot before another? She doesn't, she will. She will learn to, just as I have, making sure not to wander anywhere the Americans might find suspicious, always washing clothes in the same place, taking walks the same way, keeping the same hours, just like you have. I haven't. You have. I have seen you, my brave husband, listening to the sky before stepping out to your uncle's house, listening to make sure your steps won't be misconstrued. I do no such thing. I don't want her living like this, a buzzing in the sky, always waiting for some kind of death, you're being dramatic, and you're being cavalier. Maybe because we haven't done anything wrong. We don't let foreigners stay. We're careful who we talk to. There's no reason to kill us. I heard from Aisha that in her village, the entire Baker's family was slaughtered at a wedding. Dozens of innocent people, just like that. We don't know if they were innocent. What, the five-year-old shot down in her mother's arms? Was she guilty? But their neighbors, they may have been. They may have been hiding Taliban. And our neighbors, did you say you'd made your peace with it? She always knows when something is wrong, Sayed. Who? Wahida. Remember when my mother got sick? She started crying in her arms. So she didn't like your mother. Not everyone liked your mother. She knows something is wrong. Maybe she sees us always watching our step. Listen to me. Some children grow up with Taliban everywhere. No singing, no dancing, no running free in the hills. Don't lecture me. But the Taliban are gone, Reem, and growing up with a quiet buzzing. A quiet buzzing that melts into the sounds of cars, of bells, of children running muddy in the yard. It's not the worst thing in the world. What if she can't get used to it? She will. Now can we go to bed, please? No. What can I say so you'll rest? That we'll leave. That we'll take Wahida and our things and go to a city. I can't go through this again. We have to. What if the buzzing, what if it makes her crazy? Reem, our lives are here. We could be next. That's it. This isn't a conversation. Fine, I'm going to go sleep with Wahida. This way I won't have trouble keeping quiet. Reem, what? I thought this wasn't a conversation. The problem is you're not trying. Oh, come on. You haven't tried to ignore it. Please, I'm tired. Take your idiocy elsewhere. Take a new wife. Just let it blend into the world. Let it be another layer, part of the day, part of the night. Syed, I'm getting tired. You haven't tried. You don't want to try. I don't want to try. No, you don't. You prefer to suffer. Who prefers to suffer? You. Your life is more interesting if someone was watching us across the ocean if someone is just waiting to pull the trigger to blow us to bits. More interesting, perhaps regretting that you, the beauty of Peshawar, don't call me the beauty of Peshawar, settled down with a shopkeeper instead of a businessman, the businessman she could have had. You hear the noise and you label it fear, but it's really unhappiness. I knew you could be mean, Syed, but I didn't think you could be so stupid. So, thank you. <laughs> shooting, uh, welcoming the father of the shooter into their home to break bread. Um, but it's funny. Uh, <laughs> um, it's, inspired by, it's inspired by a real event in which um, the, the, the father of the victim uh, met the father of the shooter, and I saw a photo of, the, of these two men hugging each other. And I just thought to myself, how did I get that moment on stage? And that's where the play came from. Yeah. I consider myself somewhat an expert in plays about grief. They're weirdly kind of one of my favorite topics to explore is grieving. Um, and so I feel fairly secure in saying, I think this is a play that uniquely turns on its head everything that we expect a play about grieving mm -hmm. to be. At the end of the day, um, you actually say in talking about the play that it has more light and more hope uh, than your other work. Um, you say that you don't think the Garcias' love for each other can erase their pain, 
but the love may become stronger for it. And I would maintain that it's a complete subversion of the topic not to be writing about the healing from trauma, which tends to be the impulse, and something personally I'm not even sure I believe exists, but about hanging on to what you have in the face of that loss to get through it. So I'm wondering, do you as person, do you as playwright, do you agree with that? Or do you think as the saying goes, time heals all wounds? Well, time certainly doesn't heal all wounds. I mean, you can't, like, I, I don't believe that. Um, but you learn, you learn to live with the wound, right? You learn how to, like, if the wound is on your leg, you learn how to walk with the wound. Um, I, I feel like we were actually just talking about this um, in the room of the other writers. Um, uh, one of our instructors in grad school, Laura, told us not to write the play where love saves the day at the end until you believe that love can save the day. Um, and I, I just feel that I've, I've recently in my, in my life witnessed love being the way that you get through the day for each other. So love can't love can't make grief go away. Love can't make the darkness that comes with that kind of trauma go away. But it reminds you that there's something here to, to keep pushing through for. Um, and in my personal experience, grief has, it used to feel when I was younger, it used to feel like a stalker behind me. It used to feel like this menacing presence. And now grief feels like this old friend that I see every now and then, and we have this long history together. Um, and I don't think the Garcias are the, the characters in the play. I don't, I don't think that they're at the point where the grief is an old friend. Um, but hopefully the, they're the family that will get, get each other there. Yeah, great. Um, and do you feel like that love crosses to the father of the shooter and the family? Or do you feel like everybody has to kind of find the protection of the love in their own sphere? Yeah, Is it possible for it to cross through that membrane? We were, we were talking about that a lot in rehearsal today, and just who gets to be a victim and who gets to own that story in this context. Love is a really strong word to, to cross that membrane. I do think that recognizing, recognizing another's pain when you, when you had been trying not to yeah. is something that's possible. Um, I think opening up to listen to someone um, that you had been blocking for, for valid reasons. But um, I think what's possible is to look across the table and see someone who needs to communicate something and to just listen for a moment instead of putting forth everything you need to say. Great. Will you share some pages with us? Sure, yeah. Um, so the, uh, the, this is Teresa, who is the daughter in the family. Um, and she's 16. Uh, and right at the start of the play, she has been um, found out doing some, some naughty business uh, that gets her in trouble. <laughs> and uh, this is on the day that, that they're, they're to meet the father of, um, of the shooter that took one of their loved ones. And uh, I, it's, it's odd. I picked a section where there's a lot of dialogue, but they're, they're cutting each other off a lot. So I'm just going to read Teresa's section of the dialogue. So we'll see how it goes. Um, <laughs> So this is after there's been a big, big fight, and they're kind of in the calm after, their, after that fight. Um, and this is how it goes. Mom, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry I said that before. It's just I get so exhausted. I get so exhausted trying to figure out if, if, if what I'm feeling, if what I'm feeling is, is because I'm grieving, if it's because I'm like bereaved, or, it's something, or if it's something I would have felt anyway, if it's something I would have felt if Jesse hadn't died. If Jesse hadn't died, you know? Like, like, like sometimes I get so angry at you, I get so angry at you, and would I have felt that? Would I have I felt that if Jesse was still here? Like, would I love Howard so much? Would I love him so much if Jesse had never died? So sometimes when you, when, you, when you impose on me, when you impose on me that I have to be grieving, that what I'm doing must be because I'm grieving, it makes me, it makes me, it makes me feel resultant. It makes me feel resultant, and I don't want my life to be a result. I don't want forever, whenever I meet someone forever, or do something forever, to be the girl whose brother died in the school shooting. And you know what, Mom? You know what, Mom? I did some stupid fucking shit today, okay? I did some stupid fucking shit today, and it wasn't like my smartest move. It wasn't like my proudest <laughs> moment. And you know what? You know what? Maybe I did pick this day, like subconsciously, like unconsciously, like to, like to sabotage myself and get in trouble so I don't have to be here for this, so I don't, I don't have to be here while this guy is here, because honestly, what is this? Like, this guy is gonna, gonna what, sit here and, 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 no, you know what? You know what? It wasn't subconscious. It wasn't unconscious. I didn't have rehearsal today, and Howard didn't have jazz band, and 
sometimes I want to give my boyfriend a blowjob, and it's not because I'm a victim. It's not because I'm victimized. <laughs> it's because I enjoy doing it, okay? I enjoy it. It isn't because I feel neglected. No one neglects me. No one ever neglects me. Everyone always staring at me, waiting for me to have a breakdown or say something meaningful. I wish someone would neglect me. I wish someone would neglect me for five minutes. But, but I don't know. Maybe I did do it because today is today. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I did. Maybe I did because honestly, Honestly, Mom, no one asked me if I was cool with Jacob Davis's father being in our house. No one asked me if I was cool with that. It was just all of a sudden happening, and I don't think I am. I don't think I am cool with it. Hmm. I think it's really important to you and Dad to meet him and, like, forgive him, or, like, forgive his son through him, I guess. And I know it's important to you that I'm part of it. And I want you and Dad to have what you want. Because with everything you've been through, with everything you've been through, you should get what you want sometimes. But not gonna lie, I'm gonna be pretty angry at this dinner. Because I don't forgive him. Or his son. I don't forgive his son. I don't know how to do that. So, not gonna lie, yo, this dinner is gonna be tense. <laughs> So this play was actually part of a trilogy. And uh, he's been replaced by a man named Taishi, who she finds out is his son. And she learns that Yoshi has passed away. Um, and so what happens is that she invites uh, Taishi over to have some catfish soup uh, as to offer her condolences. And that triggers a whole spiral of events that causes her ritual to unravel and forces her to confront a ghost that is quite literally haunting her. Great. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was particularly intrigued by something you said in your Playwrights Corner interview because we're obviously about to embark on a week that is very text-centric, but you talk about yourself as a writer interested in theater's uniqueness as a space that puts, you say, living, breathing bodies in space before an audience and that you like to think about how to push the limits of the human experience on physical and emotional levels. And I can attest that the play absolutely supports that mission. The heart of these characters live on so many levels beyond just what they say. So I'm curious, like, when somebody's a songwriter, we tend to ask them, like, which comes first, the music or the lyrics? Um, and I'm wondering for you, is there a norm to whether you're a writer who sometimes starts with an image? Does it start from text? Like, what's that creation process yeah. for you? It's absolutely image for me. Usually there's one really prominent image that begins the play for me. So for this particular one, it was uh, when I was growing up, there was uh, a fish store similar to the one that I've written into the play. And there were these massive tanks of fish um, that were alive. And it was catfish mouths. You would just see them through the glass, just sort of like one on top of the other, just stacks and stacks of these fish in this tank. So that was the first image that actually came when I was writing the piece. And for me, the, the process of writing a play is usually a collection of images that I feel are somehow related, but I'm not quite sure what the associations are. Um, and then words start to come. Words start to associate with those images. And then it becomes a whole collage. And then the process becomes, uh, what's the pattern here? How do I turn these images and these words into something that supports a central idea? 
And do you physicalize those images? Like, do you make like big collages on your wall? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an ongoing process for me. I collect all kinds of pictures that I literally will put on a, on a board for me, and then words will come, and I'll put the words up there. Um, lines will come, and for example, the title of the play suddenly one one day it just went at the very bottom of the body of water. Oh, oh, let's let's put that at the top of the board. Like that yeah. sounds like it's summing everything up. Um, so yeah, it, it's definitely a, a literal process of putting the images yeah. in front of me. Great. Mm -hmm. And to the degree that you're comfortable, because I didn't know what the genesis of the play is, so share whatever you feel okay sharing. But I'm curious, was there a question you were looking to answer for yourself in, in the mm -hmm. losing of your dad, or just a question around loss in general that you were looking to answer in the play? Well, that's interesting. Um, for me, each piece tackled uh, the idea of mortality and relationship to ghost slightly differently. Um, in this one, it was uh, the grieving of a child that really spoke loudly. And um, it was, OK, I am going to share something really personal, actually, that I didn't realize until very recently. So it was working on a very subconscious level. Um, but in this play, Marina has five children. There are four older boys and then a younger daughter named Rosa Luz. And I realized that I had inverted my mother's experience mm -hmm. where she was one of four younger daughters and an older son who had passed away. Mm -hmm. um, and I totally didn't realize that I'd done that until very recently. And then I was like, oh my god, it's very personal. I just found a different way to spin it so that I could tell the story in a way that yeah. felt approachable. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. And I think will be <coughs> resonant for a lot of people. I have a mom who lost a, a sibling that she never knew because you mm -hmm. know she wasn't born yet. So I think there's going to be a lot of people who are going to show up and, and find their pathway into this play in all kinds of ways. Um, will you read us some? Oh yeah, I'd love to. Uh, so the scene that I'm going is uh, that I'm going to read is towards the beginning of the play. This is when Marina has invited Taishi over for cat for soup, and it's right towards the end of that interaction. Uh, Taishi and Marina dance. As Marina dances, she closes her eyes and begins to depart from the room. She is somewhere deep and dark, like the bottom of the ocean. She mo moves progressively more and more violently to the music. She begins to thrash her hair, her head, her curves. Taishi stops and watches her rapt. He becomes aroused. He sits to hide his boner. Marina continues to dance alone savagely, panting. She hasn't danced like this in a while. It's like an exorcism. She opens her eyes. Marina, why aren't you dancing? Come on. Taishi, no thank you. Marina, please, I'm always alone. Don't make me dance alone. Come here. Taishi, no. Marina, demanding, get over here now. Taishi shakes his head. Marina suddenly shuts off the music, rips the cover off the crucifix that is on the wall. Por qué? Por qué mi niña, mi rosa, mi luz, de todos mi, mis niños? Por qué no me, no me contesta, eh? Por qué? She howls, she composes, she pours a shot. She offers one to Taishi, he accepts. They take a shot in silence. Marina, you know, I think about that word if a lot too, Taishi. What would you wish for? Marina, I wish to swim. I wish I could have swimmed. Taishi, oh. Taishi, I'm sorry, I, Marina, no, it's okay. Taishi, I, I'm sorry, it's time for me to go. Marina, no, no, stay, just a little bit longer, please, for one more dance, a slow one. Taishi, okay, music, Marina, we don't need it now. They slow dance to the pe uh, perpetual drone of the city. Marina presses her body into Taishi's. Taishi slowly allows himself to melt and fill the peaks and valleys of Marina's body. They dance for a while. They lock eyes. Marina ca caresses Taishi's face. Marina, your face is smooth and round, like a melon. Taishi breaks away. He goes to the sink, turns on the faucet, and splashes water on his face. He scoops handfuls of water and drinks them insatiably. Marina composes. She puts up her hair. Taishi, I have to go. Marina, you can stay. Please, stay. Taishi, good night. Marina, I'll walk with you. Taishi, I'll see myself out. Thank you for the soup. He bows slightly and exits in a flurry. Marina aims her fury at the pot of soup. She hurls the lid off the pot and grabs onto the handles preparing to throw it. The catfish head emerges from the pot. It squirts soup broth into Marina's face. Rosa Luz appears laughing hysterically. Marina wipes her face with her arm in a roar. Blackout. <laughs> Okay, Dominic Pino Piero. <laughs>
bringing us home. Tell us about the Found Dog Ribbon Dance. Uh, well, the Found Dog Ribbon Dance, I kind of consider uh, a love letter to the Pacific Northwest, and it's um, uh, a story about a professional cuddler named Norma, <laughs> who finds a lost dog in the park and takes it home with her, and then begins searching for its rightful owner and along the way kind of comes across a number of <coughs> strange characters and, and also kind of finds, uh, meets a, a person that kind of opens her, uh, her eyes and her world in a certain way. And so it's about this kind of this journey with, with this dog. Great. I, I wanted to kind of save you for last because um, I, I suspect even without knowing the plays in their entirety, this will start to come clear to you. Um, this play essentially embodies every theme that we have just talked about <laughs> in the last hour. I mean, it's kind of astonishing. It is about connection, it's about grieving, it's about self-definitions, it's about the roles we play, it's about the impact of those, how those roles have on others. Um, so, and we were talking about kind of microcosms and macrocosms, so I'm gonna start with a microcosm at the moment. I'm curious about the impulse behind a play about a protagonist who's kind of trapped within herself who is a professional hugger. She like mm -hmm. curls up non-sexually with people in bed and holds them, who is inviting strangers into her home to try to identify the owner of this dog as opposed to like meeting them at the dog park. Mm -hmm. And I think the push-pull of all of those human impulses is so incredibly human. So I'm just curious, like, what was the genesis of the play? What was the first image or moment or question for you? I mean, I think, in all of my work, I'm really fascinated by the kind of anatomy of loneliness and kind of the different ways in which people are kind of all uniquely alone and, and kind of the ways in which we demand and strive for connection and kind of succeed and fail and kind of how we manifest um, this striving. And so I think to me, when I found out about professional cuddling as um, a practice, it spoke to me so immediately, uh, first because it, it, it was a profession that really began in Portland, Oregon, where I went to school and where I have a lot of family, and so it felt very personal to me because of that. But also it just felt like such a um, kind of personification in a certain way of, of what fascinates me in art, which is this, this need that we all have, that we all activate so much to, to, to connect with another human being, to, to kind of touch literally or, or metaphorically another person, another person, to see another person, and kind of the ways in which um, that can be stymied or that can be successful. And so I really wanted to examine someone that chose that as their life. And I also think I was very interested in, to me often I think people, um, in my personal experience, people who have chosen kind of caregiver type jobs, um, whether it's therapist or even yoga teacher or anyone, you know, or kind of the, the impulse to, to choose a, a profession that is so much about giving others kind of succor or soo soothing and what actually the wounds of that can itself be kind of hiding or, or, or keeping at bay. Yeah. So that was kind of a lot of um, the things I was um, kind of dancing around. Yeah. And it's interesting to me, like the idea of writing about loneliness or characters who are grieving or, or all the things we've talked about tonight, is there an inherent challenge in theatricalizing something that can feel so interior? Um, I, mean, I, I mean, I think that's, there definitely are, are challenges, of course, but I think for me, it's just always been something that I've been really fascinated with and, and a type of character that I'm, I'm really drawn to. I, I kind of came up with this term, I'm really interested in writing, um, I call them Rigby's. Like the, I, I think of like that Elmer Rigby, you know, yeah. the Beatles song, and I think of like, I'm very interested in characters that in one way or another have a, a space between themselves and the world in a certain way or between themselves and other people. And so I think, yes, that is on some level hard to, to dramatize, but I also think what you're dramatizing is not that space, what you're dramatizing is the attempt to break through that space, mm -hmm. either by them or by people on the other side. Yeah. And I think that is, uh, uh, if done right, is highly theatrical and yeah. that's exciting to me. So. Can you tell us about 
can we give away that there's a character in the play who's a dog? Is that okay? So is, is that a conscious choice for you as a writer to kind of give her that being with whom she can interact with in, in her kind of loneliest space? Um, well, I mean, for me, the dog, besides just being a, a, a deep dog lover, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, that part of the story actually came from, um, originally came from a, an anecdote of a, of a presser of mine at Columbia who had found a cat and, um, and was, was kind of talking about this strange relationship of people attempting to, to, to retrieve this cat and the disappointment of, of these people and kind of looking for this thing that they've lost and being unable to, to find it. And so that was kind of where that, the official plot came from. And then of course I changed it to a dog just because <laughs> I'm more of a dog person. But, um, <laughs> but I think for me, what I liked about playing with the dog and also making the dog character uh, a human actor rather than an actual dog or just like a, an empty space that is theatricalized yeah. is for me I was interested in the idea of so much of the play for me is about people attempting to communicate and connect with other, with other people and being unable to receive what they're looking for mm -hmm. and I was really interested in the idea of a character on stage speaking to a, to a dog that, is, that, is, that we see as a human being and what that feels like of this, of to see a character ask, speak to and ask things of this person that, and, that, and so wanting and demanding a response and being unable to kind of receive that and what that feels like to watch. Um, and, and I think that, I think humanizing the dog in that way, it, to me is interesting in that I think it problematizes and kind of clarifies that the need and the inability to kind of on some level satisfy that need. Yeah, great. I want people to hear from the play. So will you read something? <laughs> Sure thing. Um, this, uh, the character is named Norm, and I think the rest you will kind of get um, as I go. So. Go out with me. I, I, I know you probably think I'm a loser, probably think I'm a loser to be working at a coffee shop at my age, working at a coffee shop at 41, 42. <laughs> you probably think I spend all my time on the couch being lazy, being a loser, doing what a loser does, and then I come here and make coffee and I hate myself and I hate my life. But I don't. I don't hate my life. I, I love my life. I love making coffee and I love doing other things too. Uh, I, I dance. I'm a professional. I'm a dancer. Not like a, a professional, but I dance for myself uh, with ribbons uh, and a mask, and a Mexican lucha mask, usually to the music of Whitney Houston. I love Whitney Houston. I believe in the power of the music of Whitney Houston. I dance for myself with ribbons and a mask to the music of Whitney Houston. And I make videos of my dancing, and I put the videos online, and I have fans. I thousands, <laughs> hundreds. <laughs> And I love it. I love dancing. And I love other things, too. I love making homemade bread. I love the smell of homemade sourdough bread in my oven. Uh, what else? Bar trivia. I love bar <laughs> trivia. I am good at bar trivia. But not in a weird, too good way. I am just good enough at bar trivia. <laughs> I have interests. I have hobbies. You get to know me. Go out with me. Great. Because when I asked about dramatizing uh, loneliness or depression or whatever, I watched a ripple go down the line of bodies. So I'm curious if anybody wants to talk about, like, what does it take to dramatize something that is frequently interior? You, you know, Sylvia, you have a character who's coming home and not telling his wife what he's feeling, not telling his boss what he's feeling, refusing to go to a shrink. Yeah, it's been hard. That's a that challenge. Out. Yeah, it's been hard. It's hard because you run the risk of just having a really closed off character that we can't relate to. And I think like a lot of the work I've been doing recently on the play is finding ways to actually use the formality of certain situations to get to like deeper conversations. 
but it is, it's a challenge. Yeah. But it's kind of fun, but it's like a weird challenge because you're like, I want this character to be internal, <laughs> but I also want you to care about him, so I have to do something here, and I can't put a dog in my place. Why not? Mike is highly odd merger. <laughs> Claire, you were talking about subtext at dinner. Does that resonate for you at all as a question? Uh, subtext. Um, yeah, I definitely think so. I think there's, I, for me, I think that I, you can do that in two different ways for me. Like other people probably have other ways, but you could either use some sort of like metaphor. Mm -hmm. So like I think if the world itself can somehow reflect or like activate mm -hmm. um, that passive character that sometimes is useful. I, I had a play that was about a woman who was like incredibly depressed, but she like, thought there was a, she was obsessed with this whale in the Hudson River. So like that became the locus of like all of her sort of like passive depression. Yeah. And then I think the other way I do it is that if you have other characters that are trying to break into them. Um, so in Pilgrims I would say like it's definitely like you have an active character. The girl is sort of like this one who wants to keep breaking into the soldier who is more passive or more like in, in, um, holds his trauma in his body. Um, so part of it is how you can crack that. But subtext in terms of that is just it's hard because I think a lot of it is performance. Like I think you just have to also, um, we're not writing literature. I, I don't think I write literature. I write blueprints for performance. And so like I think that there's something that you have to continue to, um, t to say like this is something that is not in the text. And sometimes it's about like how do you make your reader understand what's actually going on, yeah. that something very, very clear, in performance there's actually no problem. Like we actually like to see people who are in, like experiencing stuff yeah. um, on stage and I think that we often feel even interested in sort of people that are like not totally expressive and can be very like uh, a magnet on stage. Yeah. So I think it's also just a question of like how do you make that character read well on the page? Yeah, you know? absolutely. Anybody else? Want to jump in on that one? Or? <laughs> That's okay. We can come back to it or let it go. Uh, questions from the audience or responses or thing, interesting things you drew lines of connection to or things you're going to walk away thinking about tomorrow morning when you walk down the street and you feel you are a changed person. <laughs> yes. Uh, hi, guys. I'm, I'm Stefan. Uh, I just want to say I, I love each and every one of you guys, and you guys all had something so profound with your pieces, and that's giving someone else a voice, whether that be culture, whether that be you know an animal of some sort, it's giving somebody else a voice. I was more curious, you know, just, you touched on it, where did everybody start in the process? Because I've always been told that the writer's process could be a grueling one. So like, where do you guys all start? Did, do you start with a picture? Do you start with a word? Do you start with, you know, a conversation? And how does it just go from there, you know? I'm, I'm going to quickly restate the question for the microphone, for the camera, because we did, don't have mics. So the, there was compliments offered, and then a question of, of <laughs> what is that first impulse that lights the pilot light that starts a fly? Yes. Thank you, Scott. Yes. Who wants to jump in? Uh, I can. Um, okay. I think it, you know, it, it's often not a spark for me. It's often having swum around in something that really bothers me for a long time. Um, there's something going on in the world or going on in myself, usually both, um, that disturbs me or unsettles me or frightens me, um, and I'm just like stewing in it for a long time. And I, I usually wait for a story to present itself that addresses that that feeling. Um, and then from there, it's really picking the situation that best, um, best like reveals that that experience. Um, so it's it's like it's swimming around in a thought and a feeling for a long time, and then finding the right situation to to kind of expose that feeling. Um, so it's a lot of thinking, then a shorter amount of time of writing for me. <laughs> right. I mean, for me, I think it's really exciting because I think I mean every play. Every playwright is so different, and every play that a playwright writes is so different that I think for me the process can be radically different each play. Like I've had plays where I literally just hear a back and forth of dialogue, and I don't have characters, I don't have a setting, I just have hear these kind of voices, and so I just kind of go off these voices and create this scene, and then from that scene creates a play. And then other plays I definitely have like a scenario 
or a newspaper article I've read or something very specific, and I'm like, oh, I want to write a play about this, and then I craft it. So it really feels like every every piece kind of germinates from a different part of the body or a different part of the mind in, in a fun way. Sarah, your play feels so specific. I have to believe there was something somewhere. Was it wholly out of your brain? It so it was one of the strangest plays to write. Um, I was reading the Empathy Exams, the wonderful yeah. book by Leslie Jamison, um, and it's a collection of essays that are all about empathies and really where it gets tough. Uh, particularly, she has one essay where she describes um, being a hit in Nicaragua and having her purse and her camera stolen and sort of the different repercussions of that and uh, her nose was broken and she came back and got a nose job to fix her nose but like so no one could tell but she still knew and um, she spent some time wondering about who this person was who uh, attacked her but also how much worse it could have been um, very easily um, so that I was reading that and then I just sort of sat down um, and my, uh, my, my boyfriend was out of town so I had like all this time to myself in our house and I just sort of started writing these women talking and I didn't know what was gonna happen. And it was just this process of really like listening, <laughs> like with little, little very good ears um, and just, just watching them have this conversation and it was really surprising. And, it, and then it's been a process of like refining, refining, refining. And now I look at the play and I'm like, oh my God, this is also one of my closest friends is totally this character. Mm -hmm. Oh, this character is uh, very similar to me, great. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't feel like that. It felt like sort of eavesdropping and walking very quietly and just paying attention. Um, and it's been a process of, of he hearing those voices. Um, but it was very, I was, so, I was like, oh, play, thank you for coming. <laughs> At this time when I had like four days off, I think it was like around like a Thanksgiving break. I was just like, this is great, this is, I just keep writing. I love those late reveals and Benjamin talked about kind of belatedly going like, oh, it's my mom's role in her family, but inverse. Are there moments sometimes late in the writing of a play where you go, oh shoot, I get now where this came from. <laughs> yeah. And anybody have an example they're willing to share? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that won't get you in trouble the next Thanksgiving <laughs> There's a camera on us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's watching. It's fine. No, I mean, I, I, well, I, I think there's, I mean, coming to also mixing those questions a little bit, but like, um, sometimes it happens like that and it just feels like amazing and like outside of yourself. And then sometimes you like have to write the wrong play yeah. to write the right play. So like, I, and I think, and sometimes I think in terms of like pilgrims, I wrote, I, I tried to write a play about a cruise ship that was like a, about like a girl detective that was a farce, you know what I mean? Like that was the first play and the cruise ship had its own monologues, you know, like, and it's completely different than this play. And yet I still, now that I see pilgrims, I'm like, oh, that's where that comes from. Or like that, I had to do the bad version of that to get that. Yeah. And, um, and also just like, when I, sometimes I, I, you know, you hear something and you're like, oh, that's me. Like, I wish I, it's, it's very vulnerable, I think, sometimes when you're like, oh, I do that thing. And yeah. I didn't realize while I was writing. Yeah. Do you ever have to become a different writer or a better writer or a better skilled writer to write the thing that you maybe wanted to write years earlier? Oh, yeah. For yeah. sure, and you always have to become a better writer. But I, I mean, with with this play in particular, I feel like the, the, this question resonates with me because I've been trying to write a version of this play for years, mm -hmm. and they were all really bad plays. Um, you know, they, it was it was trying to confront the subject of, of violence, and I feel like I still hadn't worked out my feelings on it. I feel like I, I was still trying to convince myself of something that I really didn't believe in these other in these other drafts of this play, and they were all too dark, they were all too maudlin, we couldn't watch it, or they made violence seem sexy and cool, which is a way of like resisting the pain of it. Yeah. Um, and there's something about this this play when it came, I like was ready to deal with the vulnerability of it, I was ready to deal with, I was ready to put love back into it in a way that I hadn't been before. Yeah. So yeah, I mean it's, 
Yeah, your personal growth sort of have to, has to meet your technical growth. Yeah. <laughs> right. I think we have a question, yeah. Um, yeah, this is really not specific to anything um, that's about this particular play fest festival. Um, but you said something that stayed with me and became this question. Um, I'm basically a performer. I react, uh, I interpret, it, it involves music, it involves all kinds of things, but for a large part of my career, I, uh, and it's one of the reasons I'm here, is I put together film projects. So I worked a lot with writers, um, and for me, when I write, it's really painful. Um, so my question is, because what you said was really interesting, you said, I, I, I don't write literature, I write plays. So I, having gone through the process in the film company of watching the blue pages and the pink pages and all the changes, we actually have screenplay, but by the end, except for the title, had nothing to do with what the poor writer sold us. Um, why did each one of you choose as writers or as people whatever you want to address, <laughs> to become playwrights knowing that it's a collaborative art. Uh, okay, so just very quickly, the question is, why write plays? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I might have put a little and spin and on that, line <laughs> reading. <laughs> I mean, for, for me, I, I, that's the, the, what you said about why write, well, I'm choose to, to write it in a, such a collaborative medium, that's the exact reason, I mean, and as a as a as a teenager, I all, I only wrote prose, and I thought I wanted to be a, a novelist or a short story writer and stuff. And I think I, I did theater, and I loved theater, but I didn't write it. And I think the transition for me was I liked the not the challenge, but or the I would say the personal challenge of of that kind of collaboration. And I think the way that theater forces you. As an audience member and as a, and as a uh, creator of it, it forces you to, to be with other people in a really uh, visceral way, you know? Again, if you're writing a play, you can't just kind of write it and then hope that it gets published or that something happens to it. Like, you have to really <coughs> get in the mud with people and, and that's not always a lot of fun, but that's kind of, like, like it's, that's <laughs> how I feel like you be in the world and like grow and be, be a, Kind of a more full yeah. human being. And Playwrights so like, are like professional cutlers. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and so I think that challenge is really is really exciting, and the fact that it isn't it's an exercise in giving over a lot of control and, and kind of having to have a lot of trust and faith in other people. Exactly why I asked the question. I think it's because we're masochists. <laughs> you know, like I think like ultimately like, theater is the most difficult art form. Like I think there are lots of other art forms that I find. Uh, I mean, I was originally a fiction writer, and I think you're only looking for one audience member, that you just have to connect to one person, and if they don't like it, they can, they can switch the play, play page or not buy the book. But playwriting, it has to do so many things at the same time, and it, there's such a greater um, chance of failure and su such a greater reward to success, I think, in theater, because it is so collaborative and dependent on other people, and also the audience. I think it's, the, it's really, um, it's a it's a populist art form still at the end at the bottom of it in which you have to respect like the audience doesn't like this part so in previews you will change it you know and that's yeah. the only thing that you do that with so yeah yeah I think that for me it's like I, I make this analogy a lot and I don't know how true it is but like for me it's like kind of like a religion in the way that like we enact this thing in front of a group of people and then we all use that as a way to reflect on our lives as a society. And I think the fact that we experience this art form with other people and we can understand their reactions and see how the group is responding is something that's really unique and powerful. And I think it, it's, kind of, it's a place where society can go to examine itself in a way that you can't when you pick up a book because we're all experiencing it together. So that's my... That's why theater for me, I think. Right? I think it's also a good way to make friends, right? High <laughs> <laughs> school would have been a lot, a lot longer with the boys with the theater. Joan, you have a question? Yeah. What is the context in which your plays have been developed to date? Is it like what is the context in which your plays have been developed to date? And what are you looking forward to in your relationship to the law? 
Okay, so the question is, what is the context in which their plays have been developed to date, and what are they looking for in this next week here at the Lark? Uh, so I, um, I first developed this play at Ojai Playwrights Conference in California, and um, I had written um, like 30 pages of it, and I sent it to them thinking they were, not really thinking they would invite me, and they were like, yeah, sure, come. Um, and I, I, in this fever pitch, um, I owe a lot to that team of actors, and I was working with Hal Brooks as a director over there, and he, I owe a lot to him too, and all, all the staff there, they really pushed me to write the rest of the first draft. So I showed up with like 30 pages and left two weeks later with about 90 pages. Um, and I've workshopped it several times since then, done like one day readings of it, where you meet the cast, and four hours later you present a reading, and then I've done a couple like full week workshops of it. And this week, I we were, we were talking before, this week I'm looking to see how far I can push the difficult, dangerous moments of the play. How far can they go until we can't come back from them? What's next for the play, Nick? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dominic. Uh, uh, it's going to be produced at the Old Globe San Diego. Um, <laughs> Benjamin, you want to talk oh, about sure. that a little bit just uh, to scan your What, if any, developments it's had and then what you want to use these 10 hours for? Oh, totally. Uh, when I write a first draft, it tends to be sprawling. Uh, mm -hmm. I tend to have too many ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, going back and visiting it in workshops, which I did multiple times in Seattle with a couple different companies, one's called Parley, which is a playwrights collective. And the other one is Umbrella Project, um, which is a new play advocacy group in Seattle, which is where I did a lot of my writing. Um, and uh, it just becomes kind of determining what, what is essential and what is the heart of the story and what is supporting that central image to go back to like how I build my play. Um, and, and then just weeding out whatever feels like a detour from that. Because I tend to overwrite just because the world becomes so vivid for me that I want to write every little detail. Um, but of course, that's, that's a novel, right? That's, <laughs> that's a different medium if I'm writing everything. So um, for a play, it has to be much more streamlined. So it becomes a process of kind of winnowing down um, into something more focused. So that's where I'm continuing that process. Great. Here at the Lark, yeah. Good. There was a question down here in the front, yes? Excellent. I'll take it. Um, so, continuing the discussion that we were starting about, like the permanence and impermanence of this particular <coughs> art form, um, and Claire, you talked about the difference between the experience of reading a play on the page and seeing a play mm -hmm. in three dimensions, um, and a play kind of being like the blueprint of getting this thought in your head into the head of somebody else. I'd be curious to hear from some of the writers what's your relationship with stage directions? knowing that that's like 50% of the play that you're writing that will then evaporate when it becomes fully realized. Are you generous with them? Are you sparing with them? Do you write in your voice? Do you write in the voice of the world? How do you negotiate that? I hate that? stage directions. <laughs> if I could get rid of stage directions, I would. But I ultimately try to just do the most important ones. But I don't. But it's also hard with a reading, too. So I think part of like what I'm doing on this week is like also to figure out like what needs to be said in stage directions so that the audience can have that in their head. Yeah, Dominic, you're really explicit about how you want the dog done on stage, which is very not doggy, right? Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, I think Claire hits the nail on the head and that I, I mean, I hate stage directions as well, and if I could have a play with no stage directions, I would, but there you have to, I think, in the process, I kind of identify what are the things that Okay, this is something that I have to clarify. This is this is one of the important. What are the kind of the, the, the battles to be fought, and what are the things where actually you're just kind of micromanaging? And so I feel like for me, in my case, like the dog is something where if you put a dog, if you have a character that's a dog, like that's opening up Pandora's box. Uh, so, uh, so you maybe you want to clarify that or give some some direction. But but generally, if I'm doing a scene that's just two people talking, like I don't really. I would rather just have the language and nothing else. So it's like, yeah, navigating what just what's, what's enough and then kind of hopefully not giving much more than that. One of my other stage directions, favorite stage directions of these six plays, was that Dominic says, 
you know, the dog barks off stage, where he says, the actor does not say woof, he says bark. <laughs> <laughs> Again, like, please do not be overly doggy. <laughs> yes? So this is, again, based off the of blueprint comments. Um, as an actor, I love hearing about how the gears work in a playwright's head. When you're writing dialogue, do you find yourself sort of playing out, out loud, the conversations, uh, acting it out, basically, and to, to see how the cadence flows? And if so, do you find yourself fighting the impulse to want to direct within the writing mm -hmm. the way that you're doing it to make sure that the actor does it just like that. Yeah, so the question is, do you ever act out your dialogue as you're writing the play? And if so, does that like create the impulse to kind of give actor guidance within the script? I definitely move my mouth a lot when I write. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly when I'm rewriting. I was rewriting earlier in the writer's room, and I was like, I'm just going to do what I do, and hopefully not annoy everyone. <laughs> Um, but for me, it's just about like staying in the world and making sure the language has the sort of velocity that I need it to. So, and I'll notice sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm changing punctuation a lot here and that. But for me, it's more like keeping the play alive for me. I have no desire to act in my plays or really direct them. I'm like, now you take your other life. <laughs> um, I think I love stage directions. I think I <laughs> differ in that. But again, it's sort of, I love them selfishly because they allow me to see instead of just hear. Because I think if, if I was just here, I think I would, people would say too much. And I would be like, no, there's another thing that happened that's basically dialogue, but it's, it's a movement or it's a, a, a very specific emotion. Um, yeah. But I, I think you have to, as a playwright, be open to being surprised by your collaborators, particularly your actors. Um, and if you go in with a very set idea of how it should be, I think you're really doing yourself in the play a disservice of, of being surprised and seeing what could happen. Yeah. Um, because if what, what I get is like just the best version of the idea I have, then like what what am I doing? Like I want mm -hmm. the thing I had no idea was going to be. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So I'm curious if you'll answer this because you have characters with very distinct gender differences in terms of women being mothers or about to be mothers. You have characters at wildly different age spans, and you have characters in different countries. You want everybody to sound like their own unique self, mm -hmm. I assume. Sure. Are you acting it out in the living room? No, I'm not. I was trying to think of a good answer to this. I'm definitely not acting it out. <laughs> I think it's more like, and I think it's something that a lot of us do with line breaks, where it's like we're trying to indicate something about the rhythm of the way that it goes. And in that way, trying to preserve the sounds in our heads, because I think it is important. Like I have a young kid in my play and he speaks in very short sentences and like very simple questions. And then I have a woman that's trying to work out something deep and she's like working through tangles of thoughts. And I don't know, it's interesting. I, I think that this line break thing is something I, I don't necessarily see in plays that are a little bit older, but I think a lot of us are doing it. Totally. And it's like to indicate this rhythm thing that we can also add to help guide that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I think language is is music, and so I think mm -hmm. it's not. I think, and especially I think for for contemporary writers, I think the the rhythms and the flow of how things are said often mean just as much as what is being said or reveal yeah. this as much. So I think, while also giving the freedom and the space for for actors and for collaborators, I think there's also a way you can create a certain kind of instruction manual through line breaks, through yeah. whatever your that can teach, it's like a score, it's a musical score, right? I mean, you're still, if you, if you give a violinist a musical score, they're still going to bring their genius, virtuosic, you know, but you're saying this is, these are the notes you're playing with, and now right. do what you want with them. But, but pianissimo can mean a different thing. Yeah, different exactly, musicians. Yeah. but, different but I mean, but if you yeah. don't have that, that score to, to begin with, it's, I, I don't, I think it can, it's, you can get yeah. more, more lost, and so I think that's, for me, what I'm interested in is, is giving actors a lot of freedom, but freedom inside a structure. Great. There's 
Okay. Yes. But there and then there. Yes. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of you guys talked about empathy within your place and also the, the, the role of empathy within theater as an artistic um, uh, uh, genre, I guess. Uh, I was wondering if, uh, and you've also talked about these worlds you created where very different people somehow find the space to connect. I was wondering if you guys could talk about the, the process and responsibilities of being a writer, creating characters very much outside of your own world and experience. Yeah, so what, what is the role and responsibility when you're creating a character who is not exactly 100% exactly like you? <laughs> Which I, I assume is every character in the play. No, I really like this question because I think we have this thing sometimes in theater where it's like who has the right to tell what story? Mm. And it drives me up a wall because it's yeah. like we only have so many people who have the privilege of becoming playwrights and like there's so many other stories to tell and people who exist in this world and if those of us that have this position don't start turning to those stories, we're really screwed on some level. And I think that you can do your due diligence and you can be responsible and you can find ways to empathize with people who are very different from you. But I think it's something where it's become this like weird taboo that I think is really doing a disservice to everyone. So that's my... And I think the responsibility is, is less an artistic one than a, like a, a human one. I mean, like, mm -hmm. I think it's like, just be like, there's like a, if you respect others and are like decent and like approach things from with an open heart and with a willingness to learn and kind of, I think, I think the problem in this, in these situations and I think that with the response often is the backlash is when it is assumed or felt that it is approached without that level of, yeah. you know, so I think it's like, if it's the same way you have to kind of treat other people in your daily life in the same way you treat people in your plays. Yeah. And so, yeah. If you approach the world yeah. with empathy, you will approach the characters with empathy. Yeah. You will invite that in the artistic team. They will invite that in the audience and maybe the world gets a little better. Yeah. <laughs> Should have saved that for the end of the panel. <laughs> 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 So consciousness of structure and the process of playwriting, does that start at the beginning? Does that wind its way in? Oh, I, for this particular play for me, I had no idea where I was going. I started with an image and a feeling, because I think when I'm responding to images and words that I've kind of uh, determined for myself are going to be part of this world, it's more, it's something I can't even quite articulate. Um, fully. It's, some, it's more just a feeling. And so as long as I'm moving towards something that I'm like, this feels right, it's, it's very intuitive. I, I couldn't tell you what the structure of the play would have been before I started writing it. I had to just follow and see where, where the story took me. Does anybody outline from the very beginning, start with a rigid structure from the get-go? No. It's not an outline as much as a, as a sense of direction. I, um, uh, Michael Weller, uh, who's one of our associates from grad school, would say that you, I'm like <laughs> half of us, <laughs> uh, um, that before you, before you start building the ship, you need to know what kind of journey it's going to go on. Mm. Um, and that, that has stuck with me, that um, I knew for this play, there was, yeah. there was something intuitively right about it taking place in, in real time um, in one location. I just, the, the pressure cooker, that was right for this situation. And then there's, there's others where I'm like, there needs to be an act break because we got to come back after the act break and things have to change. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just the general, what's the general sense of direction that supports the emotional trajectory? For me, I got to know that before, before I get in. Yeah. Yeah. Maestro Bly? Uh, coming back to this issue about empathy, usually about this time, between 6.30 and 7.30, 8 o'clock, it's this time of the day that I, I'm such a news nerd. I, I, I watch 
Lester Holt that I switched to DC that I was constantly watching. And then I go online and start watching things. And uh, my heart stops pumping, pumping, and I start seeing the folds and everything now. <laughs> and it's been so cheering sitting here for the last hour. <laughs>